Thank you. My name is Jim Peggs, and we're going to get this started. And this is Dr. Sonia Lewis. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thank you for having me, for having us here. It's a pleasure and um, really glad to be able to ta talk about this topic, which is unfortunately always timely, gun violence um, in America. We are, um, PPGV stands for Physicians for the Prevention of Gun Violence, um, and we are a Michigan-based group of physicians. We have, I think, about 600 plus uh, folks on our mailing list and we're always hoping to grow and, and um, get more support and we're um, just very grateful that there are many more groups uh, that have been um, you know joining this this effort since we got started I have a slide where I'll go through some of the history of our organization but um, Ryan Bates will talk more about and gun violence Michigan which has done a tremendous amount of work so we're just grateful for for everyone's efforts in this this area which is uh, critically needed um, let's see, so this is our, our logo, it's sort of a, a new logo, um, and our mission statement of phys Michigan Physicians Educated and Empowered to Advocate for the Prevention of Gun Violence. So that's in, in a few words what we stand for. Um, and um, I just had to put this little disclaimer, what I, I'm, I'm talking to you today um, on my own behalf and on behalf of PPGV, not my employer. Um, I do happen to work for the, the VA um, in the emergency department uh, where the issue of gun violence prevention comes up quite a bit. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, so in the realm of suicide uh, prevention, um, but my remarks today are completely independent from the VA or the federal government or uh, my employer. Um, a few pictures. Uh, so these are uh, some of, uh, you'll recognize somebody in this picture, <laughs> Dr. Peggs. Um, this was just a few months ago when we were um, at a, uh, uh, I guess it was a, uh, a gathering in support of one of the bills that Ryan will be talking about more. Um, and uh, Gabby Giffords was uh, there and uh, many of us had the incredible privilege of uh, meeting her. Um, Gabby Giffords was actually one of the pivotal um, figures and her, her tragic shooting um, was one of the inspirations for uh, PPGVs getting off the ground. Um, but so here we have, um, my slides I guess are a little out of order, but Dr. Walden, who was one of the co-founders, Jerry Walden. Um, this is uh, Dr. Mike Otto, who um, is now our um, vice president of our organization. Gabby Giffords, Dr. Peggs, myself, and my daughter, Rachel. Um, it was actually wonderful for my daughter, Rachel, to be with us at this particular gathering. She's a, currently a sophomore at Michigan State University. Um, so we, she went through the um, events that are almost a year to the day on, uh, I guess, Tuesday will be the one year anniversary of the shooting there. Um, and then this is uh, our Attorney General, Dana Nussel, with one of our star members of our uh, PPGV board. This is Dr. Kelly Huggett, who's just doing tremendous work. Um, she works for um, Corwell, um, and she's just been doing incredible work um, getting um, uh, screening for, um, for firearms uh, amongst her patients and doing counseling and advocacy for, um, for prevention, distributing gun locks, and, and doing all kinds of incredible work to, to keep her patients safe. So she's really a superstar, and we're, we're very grateful to have her on board. Um, I think this is the next slide. So I just put down a few bullet points. I think I've covered um, most of it, and I try to avoid the word bullet points, but it just slipped out, so I apologize. Um, key points here. Um, so our organization was co-founded by Dr. Jerry Walden, who I mentioned previously, and Dr. Andrew Zweifler. Um, and uh, some of you maybe knew him. Um, just both of them amazing human beings um, who've been role models for me. Uh, both of them really advocated um, within their professional work, um, taking medicine as, as a more of a community endeavor as well. Um, and saving lives isn't just in a hospital room or, a, or an exam room, but really in, in society as well. So this organization, actually the Virginia Tech shooting in 2007, in which 32 people were, were killed um, by a gunman on that campus, um, sort of triggered their desire to, to start a movement or an organization to address this topic. Um, I think it's really amazing that, that Dr. Walden and um, Dr. Zweifler, and, and Dr. Zweifler sadly passed away at the age of, what, 92 uh, last year. 
Um, but um, they were among the first people to conceptualize gun violence as a public health issue and an issue in which medical professionals have a, a key role to play. So they got this organization off the ground. They had some bumps along the way. It was difficult to get people to, to buy into this idea, but they, they didn't give up the idea. Um, fast forward to 2011, we had um, the, the shooting of, of Gabby Giffords in, in Arizona. Um, and this organization um, got, speak, got, into, got into fuller action. Um, and again, they, they really just carried this idea of gun violence as a public health crisis. Um, so one of the key uh, things that they did is they invited um, Dr. David Hemingway of Harvard um, to speak. He gave a lecture on the U of M campus. I think Dr. Pegg, you were there. This was before I joined the organization, but um, that was just an amazing thing. He's written books and done um, you know, a lot of research on this area, and he was among one of the first people to, to do more scientific work on this topic. Um, and we've just um, kind of glossing over a lot here, but our organization has done a lot in, in the terms of advocacy, awareness. Um, we've gone on speaking tours. Dr. Peggs has been a part of it. I've been a part of it. I'm giving like grand, grand round style lectures to medical professionals, um, you know, doctors at, at all levels of training um, from medical school residency and, and up, and, and not just doctors, nurses, um, any, any health related professions and community organizations as well. So just really trying to spread a message of, of a safety, a culture of safety. Um, just about two years ago, I want to say, we became a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So now we have sort of an official board structure and, and we're continuing. Really, our work and our mission hasn't changed at all, but we're just kind of organized a little bit differently. Um, so, and then this, I, I love, I actually made the sign, um, but this is Doctor's Wife Lair and Doctor Walden, and the sign says, unmutilated human flesh being necessary to the survival of life the right of the people to not get shot shall not be infringed. So that's sort of my personal mantra. I think that people have the right to live safely and, and not be threatened by guns. Um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of statistics. I, I think I will save a lot of this for, for Ryan, um, but um, this just always kind of floors me, the this, this stat that since 1968, more Americans have died from guns than in all U.S. wars from the American Revolution to the present. So, I, you know, I just, I find that really sad, really disheartening, really, you know, I have to ask myself, why are we, um, you know, eliminating each other ourselves more effectively than any foreign power has, has ever done? So I, I just can't believe that. Um, I, now, um, a statistic that many of you have probably heard, that firearms death are the leading, is the leading cause of death in, in youth and, and young adults youth, teens, and, and young adults, surpassing car motor vehicle accidents. Um, this is uh, the most recent CDC data that I could find. I actually checked yesterday, and the data does tend to lag, at least from the CDC level. Um, but in 2021, there were 48,830 deaths by, by firearms. Um, and here in parentheses, I wrote, that's a proxy for the magnitude of the problem. And, and I say that because deaths, we tend to focus on the number of people that are killed from firearms, but that doesn't take into account the, the number of injuries and the number of lives that are destroyed in the communities that are you know, crushed by this, by this problem. So we look at the deaths and they're, they're absolutely tragic, um, but it just stands for so much more than just that number alone, those human beings whose lives were lost. Um, I've highlighted the, um, in 2021, 54% of the um, over 48,000 people who died from guns were died by suicide, um, which is the most common um, type of death by, by guns. Um, so that, that's just a point to keep in mind. And then the other thing I'd like to point out, and actually these slides that I'm showing you, I, take, I, I talk to the medical students and doing their psychiatry rotations at the University of Michigan. Um, every month, and most of these slides I've, I've taken that I, I show them. But I'd like to um, emphasize also this, this small number, unintentional uh, deaths, 1.1%, 549 people died by guns unintentionally in 2021, according to the CDC. Um, and I'd like to emphasize the wording here, unintentional. A lot of times people will say these are accidental deaths, um, and um, you know, maybe a little bit of semantics, but when we say accidental, that tends to imply that that's just something that nobody could ever do anything about. It was you know, a hurricane or an act of God or something like that. 
um, that humans have no control. But in, in truth, there are a lot of things that we can do. A lot of the laws that we have recently passed speak directly to that point. There, there are many things that human beings can do to prevent um, and, you know, and hopefully eliminate unnecessary deaths due to firearms. So they're really, the, the intent is key here. These are unintentional, but I wouldn't call them accidental. Um, just uh, to make the point that gun violence happens everywhere, we tend to you know, focus on when there's a major mass shooting or you know, horrific event that makes national news and that jolts us back into awareness about this topic. Um, but it does happen everywhere. It happens in Washtenaw County. In fact, last year, the Washtenaw County Health Department put out a report about gun violence. Um, you, know, you can look at it. Um, in the report, um, this is very small, but um, I, I guess the 2020 data showed that uh, 1,431 individuals in Michigan had died from guns, and a little over half of those were, were suicide. Um, Oh my God, it just jumped to the, sorry, to the end of my slides. Oh gosh, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I didn't see Jim with the hook. <laughs> that was supposed to be my surprise at the end. <laughs> okay, well, I'm giving it all away. Um, I think this is where I was. This is a website called the Gun Violence Archive, um, just for statistics. It's a very interesting site. They actually update um, incidents of gun violence in real time. Um, so this is just a screenshot, I, this, I think from yesterday I looked at it. Um, and I, I just was curious. You can, you can put in different um, search fields and find out how many people were, were killed or injured in a specific region over a specific time. You can kind of um, clarify what, what demographics you're, you're looking at. Um, so I just was curious in January how many people in Michigan were killed by guns. And um, so I, I found from this website, 26 people in our state were, were fatally shot last month, 32 non-fatally shot. So I, I didn't do any further work to see like if how that compares to last year this time or the previous month or anything like that, but just you can get snapshots. And then you can click on, um, you, uh, at the, the far right uh, column there, you can click on the incidents themselves and get information, whatever, excuse me, available about whatever incident that was. So I think it's a very useful uh, place to get information. Um, I think I skipped a slide. Um, jumping around a little bit, but so in our organization in PPGV, we tend to focus on kind of three major, four maybe areas. Um, the first is child access prevention, um, which speaks to our pediatric colleagues particularly. Um, and just sort of to make the point that, that there are many, many homes, um, and this is an old slide, but it was estimated 35% of homes with children under age 18 contain at least one firearm. And then among those homes, uh, at least according to this data set, 43% had at least one unlocked firearm. So again, that addresses that unintentional um, number on that CDC slide, the people that we, we really can do a lot to prevent these, these unnecessary and unintentional deaths and injuries. So we focus on children. We focus on domestic uh, violence and intimate partner violence. Again, we have another law that speaks directly to this problem, but just one example of why this is a problem is that um, victims of domestic violence are five times more likely to be killed if there's a gun involved. Um, so I'm just going to sort of give one little you know, fact about each of the broad topics, and each of these topics could, is uh, you know, material for a, for a full seminar. Um, the next thing that we are um, trying to make sure we address is the issue of health disparities. Like many, many other health issues, gun violence affects different communities um, disproportionately. Um, I didn't put actual numbers on the slide, but um, you know, black men are significantly overrepresented in gun homicides compared to their, um, uh, their percentage of the general population. So, um, you know, this is just something that we have to think of when we're thinking about the totality of this problem. Um, we are lucky in Michigan, the University of Michigan has an incredible firearms uh, research institute, um, and they do a ton of research on every facet of, of this issue. Um, they're right in our backyard. They actually, on their website, have a whole, they have a bunch of articles, so if anyone's interested in doing, seeing what they have put out about health disparities, there's some really great articles there. 
Um, and then the final thing that I'll, I'll uh, spend, I think, the rest of my time talking about is just the idea of guns and mental illness. Um, and I just added the word myths to the, the title of the slide this morning. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to the idea of firearms and mental illness. And, and usually, you know, when there's a, a tragic event that makes the news, we hear a lot about how we need to fund uh, mental health care. We need to get rid of all mental illness and then we will have, you know, eliminated this problem of gun violence. It's all about mental illness and, the, you know, and that's the end all be all. And I always think, well, it's really a great sentiment that the media and you know politicians who suddenly care a lot you know really want to fund mental health care i mean i think that we, we do need more funding for mental health care but it's a huge mistake to conflate these two issues and say that one equals the other so the truth is that um, the majority of gun violence is not attributable to mental health mental health disorder or mental illness um, and in fact, individuals who suffer from mental health conditions are far more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators of it. I think that's because most of us think if we're, going to, if we're able to kill another person, we have to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I think that the comment was that many people think that, you know, somebody who would be of a mindset to kill another person must be crazy. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, that is, I think, the reflexive media response. That, but I think we just need to sort of be mindful of, of the words we use and the, the stigma that comes from, you know, sort of portraying everyone because so many of us, um, you know, struggle with mental health related issues and there's a whole spectrum of what those may be. Um, but to, then to kind of make that association and, and people do tend to think, well, if you know, I have a mental health condition, that, that means I'm crazy that, or that means somebody who's struggling might be a, a murderer. You know, that's just absolutely not, not the case. So I think we have to be careful in this movement and everywhere just to, to make that distinction. <laughs> I guess I'm being heard. <laughs> but you were indicating almost half the deaths are suicide. Yes. How do you distinguish between a victim and a perpetrator in a case of suicide? Can you repeat this? So the question has to do with suicide um, and, and sort of making that distinction between victim and perpetrator. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about suicide um, and maybe not answer your question directly right now, but um, sort of get at the distinction. Because when we're talking about mental health, I think, you know, where, where we, at least in my field, have the ability, and I think everywhere, actually, not just my field, have the ability to make a difference is in the, the realm of suicide and, and preventing people from acting on impulses to take their own lives because yes you, you know you're correct that if you're taking your own life you know you're you're the active person involved in doing that um i think we think of it a little bit differently at least i do um let me let me get to that just a comment that yeah stereotypes people with mental illness too, too, and just that, um, right to exactly exactly so that's why i think you know we want to just push back against that media narrative that you know everyone's crazy if they you know anyone who could take a life whether it's their own or anybody else's is, is crazy I think mean, it's very disparaging very stigmatizing and can keep people from seeking out the help that they they desperately need and could save lives whether their own or others so yeah we'll, we'll I keep going I, I want to make sure I don't take up all the time um, but then just on the, the topic of just mental health, multi, mental wellness, just on a societal level too, you know, the emotional toll of gun violence is incalculable. Um, so, you know, we have people who are left with invisible injuries. We don't talk about, you know, when I talked about the number of deaths being a proxy for the problem, it's really these emotional injuries um, that are just, we're, we're all, I mean, as, as the mother of a child who went through the Michigan State shooting, I personally have my own feelings about it, the way I have to, to interact with this problem all the time and of course my daughter um, and the anticipatory anxiety you know we're all wondering when, when 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 might the next shooting be and you know we all often hear people saying oh I can't believe it happened here but it can happen anywhere and then the intergenerational trauma that that occurs from communities that are particularly um, stricken by this problem just uh, you know kids growing up hearing gunshots as they walk to school things like that it just takes a huge and, and when we talk about mental health, I think we need to include this part of, of how we think of that. 
Um, the reason in um, my field why we, why we focus on um, firearms when we're talking about suicide and when I talk to the medical students, um, it's not that you can't end one's, or one can't end one's life through other methods, um, but, but firearms are um, the most dependable, um, dependably lethal. Um, I, I think it's a harsh way to say it, but it's true um, that over 80 to 90 plus percent of uh, attempts by firearms are likely to uh, unfortunately be lethal, whereas other methods, people have the opportunity to have a change of heart, to be discovered, to call 911, to get to emergency services where their lives can be saved, but really not so much with firearms. Um, suicide methods to firearms are the most commonly employed um, uh, method of completed suicide. Um, this um, is just a, a slide that shows veterans uh, suicide methods and um, it, it's true for the population at, as a whole and then it's true if you're comparing men and women um, veterans to a general population that uh, firearms are more commonly employed in uh, veteran suicides. So it's uh, for me it's, a, it's an area where I am you know, constantly addressing this issue. Uh, oh, and this is what I was talking about, case fatality rates. So, and I think this is an underestimate. So it's 82% of uh, firearm uh, suicide attempts are, are, are fatal. I think it's, it's more than that. Um, so many suicides are impulsive, even if they're pre preceded by a, a long period of contemplation. Um, and, um, you know, it can just be a small, seemingly small event that can trigger, um, a, you know, a lethal uh, event. So um, one of the things that we focus on is the fact that easy access to firearms um, is, is uh, something that we can, we can mitigate. That um, easy access to guns raises the risk of a completed suicide attempt. And that just makes sense. If, if you're in a state of despair, you know, your mind is just, you're, you're not able to kind of use those uh, thought processes and coping skills to kind of get yourself out and you have easy access, immediate access to a lethal tool, you know, this is where, um, you know, this is where things can happen and this is exactly where we can intervene and make a difference. Um, the, uh, this is old data as well, but more than 75% of guns used in suicide attempts and unintentional injuries of zero to 19 year olds were stored in a residence of the victim, a relative, or a friend. Um, so what we need to do is intervene, you know, if there's somebody that we know is in a suicidal crisis or a mental health crisis, emotional crisis, um, you know, the gold standard would be that they had no access to firearms, that their, be, their home really not have them, that there are other steps that are taken to, to care for, for firearms. Um, in my practice and, um, you know, what we generally recommend um, just the general principles of safe storage, and this is what our medical professionals have been advising for a long time, um, is that firearms should be kept unloaded. They should be kept uh, disassembled or with a proper locking device applied to them. Um, they should be stored unloaded in a safe or um, you know, appropriate container that can be locked. Um, and the ammunition, importantly, should be locked and stored separately from the firearms. Um, and then no access to the key or combination for the locks should be available to a person who is vulnerable, whether that's someone in crisis or someone with cognitive difficulties or someone um, you know, struggling with addiction or, or, or what have you. But, but you know, we want to create as many barriers between access, um, as many barriers to access as we possibly can. Um, and of course, children, if there's children in the home, all of these things should take place. Um, the U of M Firearms Institute, again, has come up. They have a great guide that can be distributed, and they've actually made it, they've de-identified it, so they've taken the U of M branding off, so any healthcare organization or anyone can distribute this um, that, that gives information similar to what I've shared and um, some, some guidelines for, for safe storage of firearms. Um, one of the things that is great, so I'm going to sort of segue into Ryan's se section of, of this presentation, but in last year, the, the um, state of Michigan passed four consequential bills that um, support firearm safety and, and gun violence prevention. Um, he'll tell you all about them, but one of the things that I think is great is that from our standpoint in PPGV, especially when it comes to the secure storage law, 
This is no different than what we've been advocating for years since we've been in existence. We want to create barriers for people who are in, in danger to accessing firearms so that they can protect their health and the health of those around them. Um, so the law, especially with respect to the safe storage law, it just re reinforces um, ideas that many of us, hopefully most of us, but in time, most of us, all of us, <laughs> are already practicing with respect to injury prevention um, and, and safe storage of, of firearms. Now I can tell patients, not only do I recommend that your you know, firearm be stored in this particular manner, but the law now demands it. So that just adds weight to, to the recommendations that we provide. So that, that's really great for us. Um, I think I've jumped around and provided a, a lot of uh, information. I think there'll be time for questions afterward. I just wanted to end with this picture that I already gave away, but um, this is Dr. Peggs, and I think that's Dr. Rivard, right? Is that John Rivard with you? Um, painting the Rock. I think that was actually a gun violence and gun violence Michigan initiative last summer. Um, so we are we're active in. <laughs> and Debbie Dingle was there too, but I couldn't find a good picture with that, even though we had one. So, but yeah, Debbie Dingle has been uh, supportive of these efforts. So, all right, that, that's what I have for now. And there's some water I just opened for it's fresh. Dr. Lewis, thank you very much. We're going to move because of time is precious on this topic, and uh, I want to thank Sonia for doing that. You don't know how lucky we are to have Ryan Bates here with us. Um, he knows the history better, but it's only about two years ago that the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan, with that spearheading energy, um, organized a cross-denominational statewide organization of people who were, and organizations who were dedicated to reducing this epidemic. And uh, Ryan is their executive director, uh, largely responsible for some of the legislative changes that we've been able to appreciate and that will take, take hold shortly. And uh, I'm, without any more ado, that's very generous. Thank you. Um, can folks hear me if I just yell, or do I need to use this for the? I need to use the microphone. Okay. Um, well, my name is Ryan Bates. I'm the uh, executive director of End Gun Violence Michigan. In the back is my handsome young assistant Jimmy, <laughs> who's uh, finished his graham crackers and is passing out flyers for me. We got to get him into the family business early. Um, so I've been a, a community organizer for 20 years now. And uh, my first job, I was uh, running a voter registration drive on the east side of Detroit um, out of a, a church called Emanuel Lutheran Church over by Chandler Park in a community that was just racked with gun violence. Uh, it was a problem day to day. Uh, parents were scared to let their kids walk to school. And the church uh, was uh, a safe place uh, and they opened up their gym uh, after school so young people would have a safe place to go to play basketball but the gun violence was so bad that three young men were murdered on the steps of that church after basketball practice and you know what could what could poor pastor Pat do in the face of, of such tragedy but while I was there he started organizing uh, Thursday night prayer processions from the steps of the church to all of the corners in the neighborhood where other young people had been murdered, uh, where there were sort of grassroots memorials, kids' teddy bears and balloons and uh, school pictures uh, for kids who would never get to graduate. And I remember feeling so powerless, you know, like, I'm supposed to be doing something for this community, but what's the point of this voter registration drive? You know, clearly the the, the issue people are struggling with is gun violence, uh, and I I didn't know what I could do to stem that tide. Um, Flash forward 20 years, I started an organization called Michigan United, which uh, became the state's largest community organizing group. We worked on issues like raising the minimum wage, criminal justice reform, environmental justice. Uh, and I'd left that job um, so I could be a better father, being the executive director of a poor people's organization. Takes a lot of time. Um, so Jimmy was six. Um, if you want to go back, thank you very much. Applause for Jimmy. Excellent. Um, flash forward to the Oxford shooting. 
and they shut down the schools uh, because there had been copycat threats. Every, almost every school in the state got a copycat threat. Imagine that, we live in a society where a bunch of children are murdered and for some people their first instinct is to try and uh, scare others. So the next Monday I was walking Jimmy to school and he knew about what had happened uh, at, at Oxford because I, I told him, I didn't want him to learn about it on the playground. Uh, and he stopped at the gate of the, of the playground and he wouldn't go in. And I looked down at him and I said, yeah, Jimmy, what's, what's wrong, man? You like school. And he looked up at me and said, you know, Dad, I'm scared. Is someone with a gun going to come to my school? And I looked down at him and said, no, no, son, you don't have to worry. School is a safe place. And what broke my heart was that my son in kindergarten was worried that his school was safe. And I'm not exactly sure it was. Uh, in fact, people who are my, uh, my age and older I uh, haven't experienced this, but when, uh, when I was in school, we did tornado drills, we did fire drills. Kids these days, they do mass shooting drills. They have to sit in the dark and be quiet with the lights off under their desks with the door locked, waiting for the police to arrive. Now, if that's not contributing to the mental health crisis we have in this country, locking our children in the dark and pretending there's going to be a mass shooting, I don't know what is. So when we talk about the issue of mental health, it is serious. But what I want folks to remember is that the gun violence is contributing to people's poor mental health. We've traumatized a whole generation of young people. In fact, there were students at the MSU shooting who it was their second school shooting they were there in Parkland, and they thought they'd go off to college and leave that tragedy behind, and they had to live through a, uh, another shooting at MSU. Mm -hmm. So uh, after not wanting to be a liar to my son, um, I decided it was time to get the band back together and started calling some of my old friends from community organizing and we called uh, the leaders of the faith communities in the state. Uh, as uh, Dr. Jim mentioned, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, the Lutherans, and many Presbyterians as well, the Jewish Federation, the, uh, the Baptist Pastors Council. Um, my, my board president, Bishop Bonnie, says, look, we haven't all agreed on everything, anything for 2,000 years. The fact that you can get all of, <laughs> all of those people on one page about gun violence is, uh, is a miracle. Uh, we brought together the, the teachers' unions and the students and the parents. Now, this is something crazy I learned. Students have now formed clubs in their schools about gun violence because once they survive it, they need to become advocates. I had the chess club. I was the president of Model UN. Kids these days, they have gun violence clubs. So we decided uh, with leaders like you uh, who are sick and tired of watching our children be afraid, uh, of turning the news on and say, saying, my God, what has become of society? With folks like the physicians who, who see this day to day in the emergency room, uh, that it was time to take action and build enough power that we could beat the gun lobby in Lansing. The reason there's all this gun violence is political, right? It's not the weather. It didn't just happen. It's because very powerful industries are spending a lot of money to put as many guns into as many hands as possible and scare, and scare the daylights out of people to make them think the only way they can be safe is if there's a an easily accessible firearm uh, in their nightstand, which is actually the most dangerous thing you could possibly do. And 
those very powerful industries are spending a lot of money in Lansing and a lot of money in Washington, D.C. to make sure that situation does not change. The good news is there's more of us than there are of them. There's a very passionate and powerful minority in this country who cares more about political donations from the gun lobby, who care more about their un uh, unrestricted ability to get whatever firearm they want and do whatever they want with it. Uh, but there's a whole lot more people who just need to be organized, who want our, 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 our children and our communities to be safe. So that was our task, is we needed to organize this very broad group of society uh, who'd been living like this and didn't want to anymore. Um, I'll tell you one more story that, uh, that I learned. I got to know a lot of the families from Oxford very well. And um, at, uh, they went to the legislature and they said, please, vote on us, give us a vote on a safe storage bill. They talked to the um, Republican leader of the state Senate, not to be partisan, but that's who was in charge at the time. And he said, well, we couldn't have a vote. You know, that would be too difficult for some of our people who, who are up for election. Maybe we'll have a hearing. We'll have a hearing. But we have to have it after the primary election because we don't want any of our members to get primaried. And the, the parents who, uh, you know, understand politics a little bit, said, okay, we'll wait till after the primary. And then they went back after the primary and said to the Senate Majority Leader, can we, can we have this hearing on safe storage now? And he said, well, we really have to wait until after the general election. You know, we've got some people in tough races. We get, we're gonna, the politics are too hard right now. Wouldn't even have a hearing on it. Lied to the faces of the grieving parents of dead children because they cared more about politics, more about campaign donations than about children's lives. So I want to be clear what the stakes are here. You fired up, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's, I've worked on a lot of issues and we can have differences of opinion, but there's a level of depravity that we've sunk into, but it doesn't have to be that way. So when we got organized, um, people of faith, students, teachers, parents, physicians, uh, we put together our agenda, which you have in front of you, uh, and said, this is the price of admission for having a decent society that's putting in the minimum amount of effort to protect our communities and our children from gun violence. Um, and we were gonna do a ballot initiative, actually. I was, I was gonna go ask Mike Bloomberg for $10 million to pay for this ballot initiative. Um, but fortunately, the legislature flipped uh, to a gun sense majority in, in the 20, 2022 elections. And we were in there with the new leaders of the House and Senate the week of the election with, with this menu. This is what we need. We need to be uh, uh, in the top three issues because we've waited long enough. Um, and this is a, this, I like telling this story because um, uh, I, like, I like it when direct action gets the goods. So the, that January, two days before the state of the state, we decided to take the demands public and we had press conferences uh, in all across the state, in Detroit, in Lansing, in Ann Arbor, in Kalamazoo, in Grand Rapids, in Saginaw, in Marquette. Almost everywhere. <laughs> Many of you were there saying, this is what we're demanding. And if the legislature is serious, this is what will happen in the first hundred days. Uh, and uh, pretty soon, uh, national reporters started calling uh, the Whitmer administration, saying, well, 
uh, you've got all these, these survivors, all these students, all these young people out there demanding change. What's the plan? Uh, and the administration called one of our board members <laughs> and said, what should our plan be? Uh, and that day, uh, uh, the governor announced our priorities in the state of the state as her, as her gun violence agenda. And I want to credit uh, Governor Whitmer um, uh, very much for her leadership on this. Um, she's never shied away from this issue and uh, has uh, used her political capital wisely. She stood side by side with us this entire time. Um, so we, uh, we lobbied, we marched, we held rallies, we did phone banking. Uh, we held press conference after press conference after press conference, people of faith speaking out, doctors speaking out, responsible gun owners speaking out. Uh, and now everything on that list is law. And children. And children, yes, there are children. <laughs> Students, young people. Uh, so one, safe storage is the law now. Um, if there are firearms in homes with children, they must be secured with a lock or in a safe. Um, as, as Dr. Sonia mentioned, um, uh, unsecured firearms in homes with children are a major reason why the, uh, a driver of youth firearm suicide and uh, uh, things like school shootings, right? Uh, that's just common sense. Uh, th then we passed extreme risk protection orders. Um, this is a law uh, that allows a judge to temporarily remove firearms for one year from somebody who has become a danger to themselves or others. Right. Jamie's fired up. Um, so typically, if someone is at risk of suicide, if they're at risk of, of becoming a mass shooter, the people in their life, they know, right? They know. They're posting on social media. They're saying things that, that aren't right. In fact, in the case of the Lewiston shooting just a few months ago, uh, his, the shooter's family knew, the military knew, and the police knew. What they lacked was a law that allowed them to go in there quickly and get the firearms. Um, so what's important about this law uh, is that uh, the general public can use it. It's not limited to law enforcement. It's family members um, or mental health professionals involved in the treatment of a patient or law enforcement. So if you're concerned about someone uh, in your life and they're showing signs that they could become violent to themselves or others, you can use this law to intervene. Uh, and very importantly, it's not criminal, right? This is a way to stop crimes, stop tragedies before they happen. Keep people out of the, of the criminal justice system. Yes, Jimmy. Well, but, but, but he could just shoot Well, you don't try to take it. The police take it. Good point. We thought of that. Um, Uh, the question was about how the indigenous can get mental health. I am not an expert on that. Um, I would refer you to, uh, there's a great organization called um, the uh, American Indian Health Center in Detroit. And they actually have a whole program on mental health access and suicide prevention uh, for the indigenous. So I would refer you there. Um, our third, our uh, fourth issue here, uh, third, is disarming domestic abusers. Um, if you have been convicted of domestic abuse, uh, it's uh, clear that you can't be trusted with a dangerous weapon around your family. Um, so this law says that uh, you are barred from firearms for eight years after the completion of your sentence. So that gives the survivor time to protect themselves. Maybe that means moving, maybe that means changing their living arrangements, and hopefully it gives the abuser time to 
make different life choices, right? Um, fourth, universal background checks ensures that every firearm purchase in the state will go through a background check process so that folks with disqualifying criminal histories, uh, such as domestic violence convictions uh, or disqualifying mental health conditions, um, can't get a gun. Um, so that applies to uh, long, long guns, rifles, shotguns, assault rifles, um, handguns, whether bought through a gun store or between private parties. So if your uncle wants to buy your gun, all you have to do is go to the police station, ask for a background check, they'll run one, and give you a permit to purchase if you're uh, qualified to, uh, to buy. One second, Jimmy, I'm almost done. Um, and then lastly, funding for safety, right? Um, we need money for community violence intervention programs, which are ways of uh, stopping cycles of violence, uh, particularly gang violence in uh, low-income communities. And then we need funding to implement these laws, right? We have to train every single police department and every single school on these new laws. Um, so, Jimmy, would you mind bringing, bringing the, uh, the sign-up sheet over here? Yeah, come on down, Jimmy. Um, so, uh, thank you, my young friend. Is there a, I have a pen. Um, here, I'm gonna give you this, this job. Um, so wait, and I will tell you what your job is. So, looking forward, there's a lot more work to do. We need to go educate the entire community about these laws, person by person, like we're doing today. So we're launching a uh, community educator program. We want to train a thousand volunteers uh, to go to uh, Cub Scout meetings, uh, PTA meetings, churches, schools, barbecues, soccer games, anywhere there, where there's more than two people, uh, and explain these new laws and distribute gun, gun locks. Um, two, uh, we're launching an advertising campaign. A uh, big Detroit ad firm that works for the big three and Netflix uh, has volunteered to produce a big uh, television and billboard and online advertising campaign. Um, they're doing all the creative stuff, but I've got to raise the money to pay for the billboards. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're raising money to pay for that public education through uh, uh, paid media. And then three, we're gonna still advocate for getting a few more things done this year, including uh, magazine limits, uh, and because uh, no one needs a 50-round uh, magazine to go hunting, right? The only reason to have an extended magazine is to kill lots of people quickly. Um, two, raising the age of purchase from 18 to 21. If beer is too dangerous for someone until they're 21, certainly an assault rifle is too dangerous as well. Uh, and then uh, third, um, uh, trying to stop these things called ghost guns, uh, which are uh, untraceable firearms that you can print in your basement and are, are easily used in crimes. So what you can do if you want to get involved, uh, my young assistant Jimmy here is going to transit around uh, with our, our sign-up sheet here so you can sign up to get updates and you can volunteer. Uh, so what we need is your money and your time. Um, so if you're interested, the pen is used for putting your name, your email address, your phone number, and your volunteering uh, wishes uh, down on the page. So if you'll start down here, Jimmy, and you'll start passing around our sign-up sheet. Uh, uh, so like all the way in the back. Yeah, start at the back, start at the front, you do you. Um, got it. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, getting involved, uh, sign up and we will get you on our list. Um, and we have, um, uh, in June uh, is uh, the next time we have like a big round of events planned. June is uh, our, what we call Silence the Violence. It's our month of action. So we're trying to have um, as many events as possible all across the state. In Detroit, it's a big march to remember the innocent victims of gun violence at uh, Church of the Messiah. Uh, in Southfield last year, they had a, an art installation uh, in uh, uh, West Michigan. Uh, they had a rally with the Attorney General. So 
whatever works for your community to uh, raise the raise awareness about this issue, because uh, these events are where we're going to try and recruit our thousand community ed recruit and train our thousand community educators. So we, we'd love to uh, uh, talk to folks about organizing something here in June as part of uh, Gun Violence Prevention Month. Okay, do I have time for questions? Yeah. Oh, sure. It, it seems that the things that you address there are all very much common sense, which it seems our legislatures have forgot what that means. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the other thing is that uh, the, the trial in, in Oxford with the parent being charged, it seems like that, you know, as, as a parent, you're, you, you're responsible for this. And how, how do you think that's going to transpire with, with the, the verdict being guilty? Mm -hmm. And now, uh, as a, I mean, you're the one responsible for all the things in the house if you have kids and to do that. So I just was curious yeah. about that. Thank you. Um, I will preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer. I only I only play one on TV. Uh, but the prosecution of the parents was actually yes, Jimmy. You just keep going. There's a couple extra ones there. Um, the prosecution of the parents actually rested on a novel legal theory. No one had been previously convicted in Michigan or most other states of um, what she was charged with was uh, manslaughter um, by uh, having not properly secured or provided a weapon to a minor. So the new law we've passed, safe storage, makes it a crime clear and simple to do what those parents did, right? If you, le if you leave your, your firearm out and a child gets a hold of it and s brandishes it, that's a misdemeanor. If your child gets the gun and hurts somebody badly, that's a five-year felony. Uh, and then once, if someone gets killed, it's a 15-year felony. Uh, yes, it was manslaughter, which she was charged with. So this uh, um, uh, this makes it very cut and dry. We're not dependent on all these different kind of factors, like should they have known? What was their mental state? Uh, you know, should should they have looked in his backpack? It's just the kid had the gun. You were responsible for it. Fifteen years. Other questions? Yeah. One of the reasons to have a loaded gun in your house is for protection. Mm -hmm. There's a way to have a loaded gun in your house for protection and still be within this law, these laws? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so the, uh, the best practice, as Dr. Sonia mentioned, is to store a gun unloaded, but that's not what the law requires. Uh, the law requires uh, the gun to be safely secured. So that could use something like a gun, a cable lock, um, which you can uh, thread through the breech and barrel, uh, but still keep loaded if you so desire. Um, or you can keep it loaded in a safe. Um, and the new biometric safes, it's just doop, fingerprint and you get in. Um, so, you know, this is something that folks can, uh, if you uh, feel that's, th that's something you need in your home, uh, uh, practicing with a safe storage device can allow you to access that firearm uh, relatively quickly uh, if you need to. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Are there statistics about um, if you have a gun in your home, whether it provides you with safety or it results in um, Problems, <laughs> danger. Yes. yes, there are. <laughs> so, do you, you want to grab that, or I can? Sure. <laughs> uh, the question was about: Are there statistics that show that having a gun in the home is is more problematic than um, beneficial or protective? And yes, in fact, there were early studies um, that that did show that having a firearm in the home was more likely to result in the suicide or um, homicide of someone in the home or, or in the community than to uh, to be useful in self protection. 
Ryan, I don't know if you know the actual statistics for that. Seven times. Oh, okay. Well, so it's, it's so for every one instance of a firearm in a home being used for self-defense, there are seven instances of it being used for suicide, harming the owner of the fire. Oh. There are seven instances of it being used to harm the owner in some way, either through suicide or someone else turning the gun on the homeowner. Uh, the firearm being used to hurt someone else in the household uh, or it being stolen or used in a crime. So we can, like, we can obviously mitigate a lot of these risks through um, uh, concepts like safe storage, through extremist protection orders, um, but guns are dangerous. The question was, are these national? No, these are, these are state laws. Um, but many of them have been passed in the majority of states. Um, so uh, hopefully we're building a, a, a patchwork of laws across the, the states that can uh, add up uh, to uh, protection all across the country. Yeah. One of my concerns with the red flag laws is that their, their implementation so are you finding cooperation within the st state for law enforcement and other agencies to be able to be willing to administer them as well as of course education which i appreciate you're doing yeah so this is a great question um it requires a lot of training of law enforcement um, because law enforcement is trained to uh go and get the bad guy after something has happened. Law, um, they are enforcing rather than preventing. So this actually requires a whole different um, orientation uh, towards community engagement and um, uh, how you interact uh, with a problem. So we've actually recruited a number of uh, experts on this who are themselves law enforcement in states that have had these laws for longer, uh, from Florida, from Spokane, from Washington. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to watch them train other police. Um, so something I didn't know, the most dangerous uh, experience police have is going out on a domestic violence call. Um, that's when someone's hurting their family and the police have to go stop them. Um, so what the experienced officers have is domestic violence is repetitive and escalatory, right? You, you, you rarely get just the one call it, that you keep going back to the same house and it keeps getting worse and worse. One second, honey. Um, and by using, by giving uh, law enforcement a tool like extremist protection orders, um, you can help them make that situation safer. You can diffuse uh, the potential for violence, uh, both for the family, but also for the officer, right? And if you can do it early enough in the process, um, uh, you, you do it before uh, you're in a tense situation. So there, we have a, there's a provision in the law where uh, an, an officer can apply for an emergency order and they don't even have to leave the house, right? If they're there in a situation and it, looks, it, it seems dangerous or it could become dangerous, they can ask, hey, are there firearms here? Um, and they can uh, uh, write out an affidavit to the judge right there and get a determination. Um, so this has worked great in Florida, of all places. Um, Flo Florida's got great ERPO implementation. It, it, var it varies by, by city, right? So like Tampa has really good ERPO. Um, it, it's a great question, and it, it re it's really comes down to leadership, right? It's which different police departments um, embrace the tool and use it. So. As advocates, it's on us to go work with those police departments and encourage them uh, to learn how to use this. I met with the, with the Detroit police um, a couple of months ago, and their first response was, well, we don't want the guns. 
right? That, that could be dangerous for us, which is understandable, right? Like being a, being a police officer is a dangerous job and we um, uh, folks are constantly worried about being murdered or shot. Um, so we have to educate law enforcement about how to use this and that uh, when it's used appropriately, it's no more dangerous for law enforcement. Does that answer? Yeah, I, that was really helpful. I, I, I think that of the laws that have been passed, this is the most complex and will require you know the most work in terms of its successful implementation. Um, one thing that I think is really important about the um, extreme risk protection order law in particular is the idea of, of education and really kind of rewriting the narrative. A lot of people, I think, jump to the idea that people want to confiscate people's guns um, and that gets kind of perpetrated inappropriately um, really when we conceptualize it as protecting people from violence and really thinking of the ERPO bill as a suicide prevention tool I think we can get a lot of buy-in and I think that's going to take a lot of education and, and repetition on that point in educating law enforcement and, and the community in general that this is the the spirit of that law this is awful we're so limited by time and so much to say but I feel like in the, in, the, in the interest of all of those who are here, if you feel like you're ready to stand up and move on to your next part of your day, please do. And if the speakers don't mind spending the next five or 10 minutes answering individual questions, um, well, we want to acknowledge that. But by the way, this, this is a simple little um, cable gun lock. These are all free and distributed at the sheriff's office. Most police stations have them. Our physicians group is uh, entertaining. Uh, we have some colleagues around the state who are having them uh, in a free take one or two in their waiting rooms at their primary care clinics. So we hope to make them at least available. One tiny note to finish on a bit of optimism. Probably three or four weeks after the, the safe storage law was, in, was signed, it doesn't take effect until Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> but right after, till Tuesday, the safe storage law, the, um, I went to price out some samples to see whether we might want to purchase a whole lot and make them available, but we no realize that's no longer necessary for us to b buy those as an organization. I went to Dunham's, which is one of the major sports outlets stores in the Southeast Michigan, at least. They sell lots of firearms. The guy could not keep them in stock. Once the, the law was signed, so many people had stormed their doors, so to speak, to, to purchase their locks so that they might actually use them and be compliant with the law. So. There's no tax on gun and uh, safety equipment for firearms. So. I, I can't thank enough our, our I'm happy to hang out and answer questions for a few minutes. So still have urgent questions. Yeah. I just wonder, one of the main reasons I think that people say is that legislators say is, well, we don't need more money. We just need those funds. We need the force funds we have. So is that the education piece, or are those laws effective in some areas? Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. Appreciate it. And I appreciate your assistant. Great job, Jimmy. Good job working the room, man. Hi. What's your question, sweetie? Yeah, you know what? Let, let's go get lunch after this, and I'll explain it all to you, okay? Sounds good. Hi. Hi. So the training sessions, um, Mm -hmm. um, how are they trained to do that um, and how, how long is the training and how long is the session be? Yeah, so we are still figuring this all out, um, but the training itself is for um, community educators. <laughs> yeah, I want to be and then the presentation won't be more than 20. So when you go out to the Boy Scout Club, it's a day so short. You can have that care or not. We don't think that some people need to be an expert. But other good understanding is that it's a safe person. I have too many things going on right now. Or you'll send that. Yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. 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 Awesome. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Members, uh, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks to our national legislation, people aren't allowed to sue the gun the gun manufacturers. Mexico is suing them. Do you know about this? There was an article, might have been New York Times or, or Atlantic. Mexico has filed through a lawyer in Massachusetts mm -hmm. against the gun manufacturers. We're looking into that here. Yes, because... Um, um, the guns in Mexico, there's only one gun manufacturing company in the whole country of Mexico. And all of the guns in Mexico come from the United yeah, States. So they're suing gun manufacturers in the United States. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Oh, I should have. I should have said that was monster man. I'm going to be the fly on the wall. Policeman might have a gun, but it's oh, the conversation just ended. Oh, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. I'll just fill in the blanks. There might be others. Thank you for uh, oh. using your email address. Okay, sure. Yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah. There's always some technical challenge. So I might, my goal is to never use slides, but then I just I use my slides. Sure. No, but you can use they, like, guide my thoughts. This blended pretty damn well. I was worried because I had these two dynamic speakers.